ask. Just okay. The other people that we're definitely going to have to uh, give knowledge to, of course, we had Sheila in the state. How about the city of Camp Verde? The mayor right on down, because you see where we're at? This would not be possible. This would not be happening here on these grounds if it had not been with their participation and their permission. So I would like a, a round of applause for the town of Camp Verde. Now we have a new addition. The reason we are here gathered, we're talking about tribal members, we're talking about different tribes, and uh, here's what I've already learned since last night to this morning. We have representation from Washington State that is here. We have representation from the state of Montana. And those are the Sioux. And then we have Wyoming, which is the Cheyenne. And one of the most important uh, people that I know of it's been a dear to my heart and has helped any veteran is Lady Cornell and she's of the Lakota tribe. Before this day, I hope that I get to meet more because I know there are more here. I know that word not only got out to all 22 tribes They've been invited here. And I'm gonna go announce that for now, here with the Yavapai Apache Nation, we have declared March 31st today, the day of recognition. Now you might be wondering what it is that we're recognizing. Well, I'm gonna lead up to that because of what happened in 2020, there was a dedication, uh, there was a building of, uh, how do I uh, do this? Uh, don't wanna, I don't wanna sound political, okay? I don't wanna go there with that, but I do wanna give credit where credit is due. Credit is due that in 2019, Donald J. Trump got together with the Smithsonian and said, this time I want to be able to do something for the Native American people that can't be marred as he did with having the speech with the Code Talkers. It was a good speech. And then the media downplayed it. Then he wanted law enforcement to be there in to help as an auxiliary to prevent more Native American girls from being kidnapped from reservations. That too was downplayed and marred. But before he was ready to give up, he was never gonna give up. He went to the Smithsonian and he says, this is my idea, what do you think? First thing they said was, can't do it, we, get, we don't have any room. We've used the floor space, the walls, and even the space in between the walls and the ceiling. We have no room. They said, if we had some land, uh, that might help. He said, have you forgotten? I'm a realtor. <laughs> so a block and a half, half away, <clears throat> he gave a deed and land to the Smithsonian to build this monument. They together found the designers, the artists, and the concept came together. He said, I got one stipulation that I want you to understand. This is 2019. I want this project to be done before Veterans Day on 2020. Things were going good. Two months before everything was completed and it was almost completed, they said, uh, sir, uh, we're having some problems. We're running out of funds. 
He said, let me talk to my administration. That was in the morning. An hour later, he calls back and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you dollar for dollar for everything you've already spent, which means there's going to be change left over. He says, so with that change that's left over, he said, we're going to give you acquisition to a path from the Smithsonian to this new monument. And he says, I have already picked the statues and emblems of things that need to be placed there. And we will call it the path to the National Native American Veterans Memorial. However, the 2020 came. I mean, everyone knows that the elections come before the Veterans Day. He was shocked. Attention was taken away from that project. He concentrated on other things. And it went under hold, especially since the p pandemic. So it laid dormant. It laid dormant for two years. So 2022, which is 11, 11, 22 at 11 a.m., I was asked to help dedicate the monument. I did, I did this at Sedona Heritage Museum at the same time it was being done in Washington, D.C. I don't mean to be long-winded, but I'll let you hear what I told them. Native Americans, my brothers and sisters, this is about us. American Indians and Alaska Natives served in the armed forces at least five times the national average and have served with distinction in every major conf conflict for over 200 years. <laughs> Considering the population of the U.S., it is approximately 1.1 Native and the military is 1.7% Native, not including those that did not disclose their identity. Native people have the highest per capita, it, capita involved of all population to serve in the United States military. They also have the highest concentration of women service members than all the other groups. Nearly 20% of American Indians and Alaska Natives service members were women, while 15.6% of all other service members were women. During World War I, 3,000 to 6,000 American Indians enlisted and another 6,500 were drafted. About two-thirds served in the infantry, winning widespread praise for bravery and achievement. But the cost was high. About 5% of the American Indian combat soldiers were killed compared to the 1% of American foe overall. Back in the state, some 10,000 American Indians joined the Red Cross, donated time, money, and clothing. American Indian people also bought war bonds. By the war's end of November 1918, they owned $25 million in bonds, about $75 of every American Indian man, woman, and child. During World War I and World War II, a variety of American Indians' languages were used It sent secret messages. Codes for the enemies were never able to break. In World War I, Choctaw and other American Indians transmitted code messages by telephone in their tribal language. 
Although not used extensively, the telephone squads were key in helping the U.S. win several battles that ended the war. American Indians enlisted as overwhelming numbers after Pearl Harbor in 1941. Just like in World War II, the Army used American Indians recruiting to find native language talkers who were willing to enlist. The Marine Corps recruited native co uh, Navajo co-talkers in the 1942 and then established a co-talking school. Forty-four thousand of the total American Indian population of 350 saw active duty including 800 women. For this service they earned at least 71 air medals, 34 distinguished flying crosses, 51 silver stars, 47 bronze stars, and five medal of honors. <laughs> Approximately 10 thousand American Indian soldiers fought during the Korean War and around 194 died in that battle. During the Vietnam of the 42,000 American Indians who served, 90 percent were volunteers. Approximately one in every four eligible American Indian people served compared to one in 12 in the general population. Of those 226 that died in action, five received the Medal of Honor, which wow. that is behind us. Since the Gulf War, the U.S. has engaged in and on the ongoing series of conflict, primarily in Afghanistan and Iraq. American Indian men and women continue to serve in high numbers at the home and abroad. According to the Department of Defense, more than 24,000 of the 1.2 million currently active duties service members are American Indians. And the 2010 consensus identified over 150,000 American Indians and Alaskan Native veterans. Sadly, American Indians and Alaskan Natives volunteers, uh, veterans, have lower income, lower education, attainment in higher unemployment than the veterans of the other races. They also have more likely to have lacking of health insurance and have a disability service connection or otherwise than the veterans of other races. About 19% of the American Indians and the native Alaskan veterans have had service connection disability ratings in 2010 compared to the 16% of veterans in all other races this is according to the Department of Defense. To date, 27 American Indians have been awarded the Medal of Honor, the national highest military honor. American Indians have participated in every major U.S. military encounter uh, from the Revolutionary War to today's conflicts in the Middle East, yet no landmark had yet been made or national recognition of this contribution. Thankfully, the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indians and the Trump administration was currently working on the National American Native Memorial anticipated to be open on 2020. Despite the project, completion of the prior to Veterans Day on 2020, election results in the COVID pandemic focus attention elsewhere and away from the complete project. The complete project was placed on hold until Veterans Day of 2022. 11 11 at 11 2022 the official dedication was finally made 
Republic to all the United States across the United States. No longer past due, our recognition has finally arrived. And I say to all the Native people of America, the reason we are here is because this too is our land. The U.S. Constitution is our Constitution. The Bill of Rights are our Bill of Rights. And together we stand and remember only divided would we fall. change everything. What I'm going to say is Red Skeleton was a comedian and an individual who had been patriotic and had my, my admiration and he did something that was so awesome I always remembered it and I looked it up and I found it. He did the Red Skeleton Show. It was called the Red Skeleton Hour. And Red Skeleton did what he called the Pledge of Allegiance, our Pledge of Allegiance. And mind you, I want to have you keep in mind, please, what you hear, understand, this was January 14, 1969. Again. 1969. On his show, he said, getting back to school, I remember the teacher that I had. Now I only went, and I went through only the seventh grade. I left home when I was only 10 years old, and I was hungry, <laughs> and this was true. I worked in the summer and then went to school in the winter. But I had this one teacher, he was the principal and of Harrison School in Rents, Indiana. To me, this was the greatest teacher and a great sage of my time. However, he had such wisdom. We were all reciting the Pledge of Allegiance one day, and he walked over. This little old teacher, Mr. Laswell, was his last name. He said, I've been listening to you boys and girls recite this Pledge of Allegiance all semester, and it seems as though it is becoming mundane to you. If I may, may I recite it and try to explain to you the meaning of the words? I, me, an individual, a committee of one, pledge, dedicate all my worldly goods to give without self-pity, allegiance, my love, and my devotion to this flag of our standards, oh glory, a symbol of freedom, for she waves their respect because your loyalty has given her a dignity that shouts freedom for everybody's job in the United. That means, yes, United. That means that we all have all come together, states of America, individual communities that have united into 48 great states, 48 individual communities with pride and dignity and purpose, all divided with imaginary borders, yet united into a common person that uh, purpose 
that love for the country and to the republic for which it stands republic a state in which sovereign power is invested in the representatives chosen by the people to original homelands the verde valley is our home our original homelands is 20 miles east and west of the verde river so welcome everybody to here for here and we have uh, several groups we asked to come and honor our veterans for today it was wonderful to be able to be approached and be asked to for the nation to participate and by all means we said yes our veterans is why we are here and celebrate each and every day that we have in this wonderful country we live. I'd like to introduce our, our group here that is going to do an honor song for all of our veterans. They're Maswade. They come from our sister tribe, the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation.
wake up to a dinner spirit back in the rail. I actually have a program here. So I was a corpsman. I was lied to. I was told that I was going to be able to date nurses and pass out pills. <laughs> but I did get a quick trip back to Camp Pendleton to get an M FMF, which is Fleet Marine Force. I was also a member of the MAF, which is the Marine Amphibious Force, third. Then they shipped me off to Vietnam. My first job was collecting body parts, put them in a bag, and weighing them to be sure they didn't weigh over 175 pounds. I did not like that job. That didn't last very long. They sent me to the closest Marine Corps hospital. We had a ship, a hospital ship out in Da Nang Harbor. So I served there for another week. And then they said, ah, <laughs> we finally found out where you're supposed to be. So we're gonna put you on a Huey and we're flying you out. So get your gear, keep your head low because you're already engaged in hostile fire off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So I got on that bad boy and I flew out there quite a while and then all at once we came into a clearing and I could hear the popping the closer we got. And they put me on the ground and they said, you're behind the lines, just go straight forward that way and you're good to go. See, I was supposed to be a corpsman, I was supposed to just fix people, fix their wounds, give them morphine get them to aid, and I did do the best I could, as often as I could, to keep them alive. But I knew I wasn't a conscientious objector, because they issued me a Colt 45 and a submachine gun. And yes, I fought alongside, back to back with these individuals. And could they have put me with a better group? Well, I'll tell you what happened. They put me with a group they had a bounty on their head. <coughs> they kept knocking out the Ho Chi Minh Trail with their artillery. Then they did something that really ticked off North Vietnam. We were the first recons to go across at night, across the DMZ, recapture the captives that were on their way to Hanoi and bring them back to safety on the south side. For that, that bounty was placed on us and we couldn't go anywhere anytime. And you can look it up on the, your internet. We suffered the most casualties of any Marine Corps unit in Vietnam during this duration. And we, I'm proud to call myself the walking dead and I'm no zombie. Yeah, but he's going to come. 
down a lot closer so he can rattle your chairs, okay? You can't hear me, but thank you, Terry. <laughs> Care C, War Cloud of the Colville Confederate Tribe is here. And he told me that he was going to do something really special. He's going to do the Cougar. Wherever you're at, Chrissy, come on up front. Oh, oh, no. Oh, good. You know, I got somebody here that ha has a better schedule than this when I hold it in my hand. Yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, our next, the next group we have coming to us is our local group, our bird group. It's called the Yabo Pai Apache Nation Bird Singers. That is... Uh, mentored by our fellow relative, husband, brother, cousin, father, Ron Juan, and his young group of men. Everyone is welcome to come and join and dance with our with our bird group. Those who can stand, please stand.
Just like that, huh? Just like you. <laughs> okay, my name is Norman Smith, member of the Yavapai Apache Nation. It's ironic that we're right here in this location. Right behind me is a fort that took my people, the Yavapai and the Apache people, around 18, 1870, 1876. They gathered us up and took us 180 miles south to San Carlos. Kept us <laughs> in captivity for 30 years. But all that, and you know, I had, a, I had a little bit of a difficult time trying to decide, do I serve the army that took my people, that kept them in captivity, that massacred by the hundreds. 1876, when they went to San Carlos, there was only a handful of Yavapai and Apache people. Well, in 1970, I decided I'd join the Army. Ended up in the 18th Airborne Corps, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I served for six years. You know, it was a tough decision as a native soldier to, to once stand side by side with you all for a cause much greater than us. But I lost good friends in Vietnam. There's a couple of things wished would have been mentioned by a moderator here. That's, uh, that's the ones that were drafted. What about them? Not them. They were asked to do a job way far beyond those that volunteered. The other one is my good friend, Hawaiian. They're native people too. They should have been recognized. They're proud people, just like us, just like the, the, the American natives. They're, they're, they're native to us. They're our relatives. But anyway, I, I just wanted to bring that point out. But it's important that we all get recognized in all wars. You know, it's not a, it's not a, a very good thing to, to take part in. But we, we had to do it to, to help the world, to try to heal itself. We have to heal it as a people. But anyway, I just wanted to bring that out. You know, just, uh, they're important to me. You know, very important. Especially those that we just mentioned, the two. So I hope that whenever you give this talk again, that, that it's mentioned. Yes, I will. Thank you. Love it here. Yeah, all the way. Yeah, he is correct. I, I, w I will have to amend my uh, my paperwork to mention those that were drafted. Talking about drafted, you know what? He said that word, you know what it brought to me? 1965, I am a student in North Denver High School, and we go to school, <coughs> and they tell us that we got to line up after we got dressed in the locker room. They said, line up in the gym, basketball court. We got up there to find tables and people and handed a clipboard, and, and we were uh, discussing what we had to do. What did we have to do? We had to take a physical. They had our names, and we went down the line, and we had a physical. And I said, I got an A1. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> and then we had a guy that was just so messed up. I mean, he had uh, taken big falls, and he had a pin in his leg, and, you know, I mean, uh, he, 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 he took a 
physical beating, and you know what he got? He got a 4F. Uh, what that meant was that he, no way, was going to be inducted. Later on, after that examination, in the mail, I got a ref card. <laughs> but I chose to join myself. I volunteered. But yes, there were those that weren't given the choice. They said, you either go, and those that chose not to go, a lot of them ran up to Canada. <laughs> so that was then, but today is now. What I've got now to introduce is my friend. Yeah, not yet. Okay. Oh, you know what? I'm going to have to back off and give the mic here to somebody who knows what's happening here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Norman Smith. I appreciate your words and appreciate and thank you for your service. You are right up to that. Forget about those who have been drafted in our Hawaiian family as well. Normal when you bring up draft, I think of my father. My father is a Vietnam veteran. He is no longer with us. My father had goals and aspirations. He was accepted into ASU to go into accounting. But the government called him and he was drafted and he went and he served this country that we are here today with. So thank you, Norman. I really appreciate that. Our next group that we have is our one of our local singers as well, who is also our mentor, and, and his name is Martin Laredo with the Dilja S Singers. Thank you. 